and in this video I'm going to be sharing with you my personal top 5 pieces of evidential information concerning the potential innocence of both Michael Steele and Jack Wombs. It was a crime which pushed everything else off the front pages. Three men, all known criminals, found shot dead in the Essex countryside. It was a cold-blooded professional killing. The victims had many enemies, but which one wanted them executed? And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Okay, so let's start with the first piece of evidence, the getaway vehicle for the evening of December the 6th. This, according to Darren Nichols, the getaway driver, was a VW Passat Estate colour beige. This vehicle took Jack Wombs to Workhouse Lane and it also picked up both Michael Steele and Jack Wombs after these murders had been committed. Now the first thing that strikes me when looking into the getaway vehicle is the fact that we don't actually have any verified sightings of that vehicle. Now, in Darren Nichols' own words, this vehicle travelled to the halfway house, it travelled to Workhouse Lane, and it also travelled to the Traveller's Joy public house. Yet we don't have any eyewitness accounts of anybody seeing that vehicle on December the 6th at either of those locations. Now, according to the word of the getaway driver, Darren Nichols, on the evening of December the 6th, this VW Passat estate first makes an appearance at Mark's Tay. It's there, driven by Jack Wombs, that the Passat comes to a halt, and Nichols and Jack Wombs in that vehicle then head towards the Halfway House pub. The VW Passat is parked up in the pub car park for a matter of time, then the Range Rover containing Tucker, Tate and Rolf pulls into the car park. Jack Wombs and Darren Nichols, still in the VW Passat, then make their way towards Workhouse Lane. The Volkswagen Passat approaches the lane from the direction of the Rettenden Turnpike, meaning that it would have most likely have had to have stopped traffic coming in the opposite direction in order to turn down Workhouse Lane. The Volkswagen Passat proceeds into Workhouse Lane, it's turned around, Jack gets out of the vehicle, takes a coat and a bag from the back of that vehicle and disappears into the darkness. Darren Nichols then pulls back onto the A130 and heads towards the Wheat Sheaf pub. He arrives at the Wheat Sheaf and again parks in the pub car park. He cannot receive a very good signal on his mobile phone, so he leaves the Wheat Sheaf, heads back past the lane and turns left, which we believe is around Meadow Road. He turns up Meadow Road and parks the vehicle there. Once Darren Nichols has received a telephone call from Jack Wombs to come and get him, he pulls out of Meadow Road, back onto that main road there, heads towards the lane, cuts across the traffic once again, and waits for Michael Steele and Jack Wombs to enter the vehicle. When they do so, they are both covered in blood. This Volkswagen Passat then turns back onto the main road, takes a left towards the Rettenden Turnpike, and eventually ends up at the Traveller's Joy, or what was called back then the Hungry Horse Pub. Now, why I'm mentioning all of these locations is that this vehicle... This VW Passat estate, colour beige, has spent quite a lot of time in different locations. It spent a matter of minutes at the Halfway House pub, parked up. It has pulled away from that location. It has most likely had to have stopped traffic whilst cutting down Workhouse Lane. This vehicle has then parked up in the pub car park of the Wheat Sheaf. It's there, stationary where Darren Nichols realises he doesn't have good signal on his phone. He pulls back out of there and, as I say, parks up on Meadow Road for a period of time. So we've got the halfway house where the vehicle was parked up. We have Meadow Road where this vehicle was parked up. We have the Wheat Sheaf Pub Car Park where that vehicle was parked up. And we also have the Traveller's Joy. What I find interesting about a couple of these locations, and in particular the halfway house, and the Traveller's Joy, is that both of those locations are next to busy roads. Now, as many of you at home will be aware, when this murder occurred back in 1995, this wasn't just local news. This was national front page 
headline news. Every newspaper was running the story. It was on the radio, the TV, it was everywhere. This was a big deal back when it happened in 1995. There were press conferences held by the police seeking eyewitnesses to come forward to give information on what they may have seen on the evening of December the 6th. So there was a lot of information pumped out there by the media, by the police themselves, seeking eyewitness accounts. Yet we don't have one. We don't have one eyewitness account of anybody seeing that very distinctive beige Volkswagen Passat estate. Now the reason why I find the getaway vehicle so fascinating and how it could possibly lend to the potential innocence of both Michael Steele and Jack Holmes is when we take a look at Darren Nichols' story as a whole here. Now as many of you will be aware and as I've covered in previous videos, Darren Nichols was always treading a very, very fine line between having prior knowledge of these murders and being implicated in the murders himself, or simply knowing nothing about it whatsoever. Darren Nichols was always trying to give enough information to appear credible, but not too much so that he was actually involved in the murders himself, if that makes sense. But where this gets a little bit more intriguing is the fact that the getaway vehicle doesn't really serve any sort of purpose. There's no reason for Darren Nichols to lie about the vehicle that he was driving that evening. If anything, it's imperative that Darren Nichols tells the truth about the vehicle that he drove on the evening of December the 6th. So given the fact that it doesn't actually really serve any purpose whatsoever for Darren Nichols to be dishonest regarding the vehicle he was driving that night, then how do we explain that no eyewitness accounts actually exist of anyone seeing that Volkswagen Passat. Now, the nearest that we have to an eyewitness account comes from a lady by the name of Sarah Earp, a video which I had just covered very recently. Now, she claims that she saw a beige-coloured vehicle, a beige-coloured vehicle parked on Meadow Road, but she doesn't mention a driver. She couldn't see if there was a driver in the vehicle. She couldn't see if the vehicle was running. She couldn't say if it was a Volkswagen Passat. So really, you, you can't really call that statement particularly credible. The only thing really that it's got going for it in, in terms of that statement on its own is really just the colour of the vehicle that she witnesses, a beige vehicle parked alongside a Ford Fiesta, I believe it was. Now, just to give you a little bit more information regarding the Volkswagen Passat and its likelihood of being the actual getaway vehicle on the evening of December the 6th, we need to look at the crime scene itself. The fact that we have tire tracks in front of you here in these photographs and this Volkswagen Passat according to the book Blogs 19 actually had four different brands of tires on it so that's not just four different brands in terms of Michelin, Hankook, whatever maybe a budget tire what's important about that is the fact that you'd have four different tread patterns yet not one of those tread patterns is visible or evident in Workhouse Lane if this vehicle has both pulled into Workhouse Lane when dropping Jack Wombs off, pulled out of Workhouse Lane, parked up somewhere nearby, then returned to Workhouse Lane, collected steel and Wombs and driven off again, that's four separate occasions that this Volkswagen Passat's tyres have touched that area. Yet not one tread pattern, not one tread pattern at all, in all of those tread patterns that you see in front of you there, is actually matched back to that Volkswagen Passat estate. Now, I know that some people are going to say, well, they, the police arrived on the scene. They didn't know what they were looking at. They, you know, they didn't, you know, it was a bit of a shock. They found this Range Rover. No bollocks. The first thing you do when you arrive there is you work out how the killer has entered and exited the crime scene. You look for evidence. And that's shown by the fact that we have tyre markers here. They've looked at these tyre tracks. They didn't just get there, drive over all the tyre tracks, and then about four hours later think to themselves, oh, hang on a minute. Actually, he might have driven in by a car, mightn't he? No, that's not quite how it works. One of the first things that they would have done is get the tread patterns. And there is evidence of that, as I say, by those yellow markers which are left in the crime scene photographs there. Now, the last point worthy of mention concerning the getaway vehicle is the fact that they found it. They found the vehicle. They found the very vehicle that Darren Nichols claimed he was driving on the evening of December the 6th. The police recovered that vehicle. The very vehicle that both Michael Steele and Jack Wombs were claimed to have been in, both covered in blood. This vehicle was scientifically tested. There was no blood found in the vehicle, no DNA evidence matching the crime scene. 
There was no gunpowder residue matching the cartridges which were fired at the scene of the crime. Nothing evidentially, nothing scientifically speaking, was found in the Volkswagen Passat to link Michael Steele and Jack Wombs with these triple murders. The second point which I wish to draw your attention to is the actual character of both Michael Steele and Jack Wombs. Let's take a look, for instance, at Michael Steele's criminal history for one moment. March 1964, sent to prison for 12 months for stealing property and driving while disqualified. 1966, sent to prison for 6 months for stealing property and assault, causing actual bodily harm. June 1966, a 12 month conditional discharge for stealing from a vehicle. 1968, fined £15 for possession of an offensive weapon, a motorcycle chain. February 1969, an 18-month jail term suspended for three years for trying to cheat customs of oil duty. March 1972, sentenced to five years in prison for theft from a motor vehicle. February 1980, suspended sentence for six months for theft. September 1980, sent to jail for 12 months for stealing tyres and wheels and being in breach of a suspended sentence. 1986, one year conditional discharge for criminal damage. June 1990, nine years in prison for importing 300 kilos of cannabis in a light aircraft. Steele, a highly experienced pilot, was also ordered to hand over to customs £120,000, half his former marital home, £15,000 from his mum's home, his 33 foot motor cruiser, his aircraft, and his land cruiser. So there is a lot in there regarding theft regarding drug importation. But is there anything that tells us that either of these individuals was actually capable of killing Tucker, Tate and Rolf? And I don't just mean squeezing the trigger on a shotgun. I mean, could they have committed this crime in the way in which it was carried out? So concisely, so quickly, leaving no trace behind, as it were. Is what we know about these individuals reflected in the crime that we see before us. Now it's fairly evident that both of these individuals were drug importers, but does that necessarily mean that they are responsible for the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolf? When we take a look, as I say, at Michael Steele's previous history, there's no real sentences for violence or firearms offences, there's no GBH charges here throughout his history, we're not looking at two overly aggressive individuals. At least that's how it's portrayed in their previous sentences. We had uh, Jack Wombs, who was done for, was it car ringing, I believe it was? But nothing in terms of, as I say, GBH or firearms offences. Yet we're supposed to believe that these two individuals, both an engineer and a mechanic, were responsible and capable of killing Tucker, Tate and Rolf. And now we move on to point number three. The fact that we have so many other potential suspects. We had Billy Jasper come forward, say that he was the getaway driver that evening. We had the death of Kevin Whitaker, the money that was lost and taken by Rolf and Tucker during the murder of Kevin Whitaker. We had the situation surrounding Leah Betts, her father being an ex-policeman. All of the media outrage and media storm that was whipped up by the death of Leah Betts and the supply of ecstasy in Essex. And then we have all of the individuals, all of the firms and outfits that we've probably never even heard of, who had run-ins with Tucker, Tate and Rolf. No doubt there are scores of people that were either done over, stitched up, maybe threatened or even physically assaulted by these individuals who we've probably never even come across during our time looking into this case. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons why this case is still talked about today. Tucker, Tate and Rolf had a multitude of enemies, a multitude of people who wished to see harm on these three individuals. And then we move on to point number four, one of the more obvious ones. The fact we don't actually have any eyewitnesses. We don't have any eyewitnesses according to Darren Nichols' version of events. Nothing really to corroborate what Darren Nichols claims is factual. We don't have any eyewitness accounts, as I said earlier, of the Volkswagen Passat of the Range Rover turning down the lane at a certain time, of gunshots being fired at a certain time. There's nothing really evidentially speaking in terms of outside information 
that tells us that Darren Nichols' version of events is actually the truth, that it actually ever happened the way that Darren Nichols claims it did. We don't have any first-hand accounts, first-hand eyewitnesses of the crime itself. I mean, that goes without saying, but we don't, do we? We don't have anyone who actually witnessed these murders taking place. We don't have any eyewitnesses who saw Wombs and Steel in the general vicinity. We don't have anyone who has seen Wombs and Steel at the halfway house, or the Traveller's Joy, or Wombs walking down Workhouse Lane, next to a very, very busy main road. The road which was, back in the day, the main road through to South End. No one seeing Jack Wombs getting in or out of that vehicle. And lastly, point number five. We have no DNA, no forensic evidence tying Michael Steele and Jack Wombs to these crimes. No fingerprints outside the Range Rover. No fingerprints inside the Range Rover. No fingerprints on any of the items recovered from inside of that Range Rover matching Michael Steele and Jack Wombs. No footprints matching Michael Steele and Jack Wombs. No DNA recovered outside of that Range Rover matching Michael Steele or Jack Wombs. And no DNA or forensic evidence recovered from the said getaway vehicle, the Volkswagen Passat Estate, driven by Darren Nichols. Nothing whatsoever to tie Michael Steele and Jack Wombs to these crimes. <laughs> 